Greetings grade 11 and grade 12 and welcome to Ubuntu Academy, Lessons That Empower. And today we are going to be looking at a topic which is covered in both grade 11 and grade 12 physical sciences. So this lesson is about um, that topic and uh, we hope that by the end of today's lesson you will feel empowered and you'll also have a better understanding of the part of the, less, uh, the topic that we're going to be covering in today's lesson. Um, this topic, Newton's laws and applications of Newton's laws, is uh, assessed or examined in both grade 11 and grade 12. So you should be uh, uh, expecting it, even though you're in grade 12, you should be expecting this in paper 1 of the grade 12 final exam, together with the June exam and also the preliminary examination. Um, there are a few things that you need to understand before you go straight into the laws. We know that there are four laws um, uh, that we need to learn under this topic, and that's Newton's first law, Newton's second law, Newton's third law, and Newton's law of universal gravitation. But beco before we go into the laws themselves, we need to have an understanding. According to the exam guideline, together with the CAPS document, we need to have an understanding of the different kinds of forces, or the different types of forces. Now, the reason we have to start here is because all four laws are about forces. All four of them have to do with forces. So before we can be able to apply the laws, we need to understand forces first, and then we can learn the laws and have an understanding of the laws first. So let's go straight into it. The first type of force that we're going to be looking at is the most common one, which is referred to as weight or the force of gravity. Now, this is a force that is exerted on a physical object by the earth. So, the object that experiences weight or the force of gravity is, a, is, is an object that is physical. In other words, it has mass. It's made of matter and it has mass. And therefore, it will be attracted by the earth. Now, the symbols that we use for the force of gravity or the weight is either Fg or W. Now, if you prefer using W, you can use W. If you prefer using FG, you can also use FG for force of gravity. W stands for the weight. And uh, this is one of the few forces that has a formula that you can apply or use to calculate this force. Now, that's the formula. Um, w is equal to M times G. Or Fg is equal to M times G. It's the same formula. The only thing is the symbol that is different is the symbol. You either use W for weight or Fg for the force of gravity. Uh, well, let's look at what each of the three things that appear in the formula stand for. Obviously, the W stands for the weight. And the other important thing that you need to remember is that being a, a, a force, weight being a force means that it is also a vector quantity and therefore it has magnitude and direction. The magnitude is measured in the units called Newtons, capital letter N for Newtons. So you have to be able to, to work with that. And then the M in the M times G stands for the mass, which is always measured in kilograms. So if your mass is given to you in any unit other than kilograms, you must be able to convert those units to kilograms first before you can work with them. And then lastly, we have the G, which is gravitational acceleration. Now, this gravitational acceleration is a constant. It, it will always be 9,8 meters per second squared, no matter what. So it's not uh, something that you need to look for. It's something that will always be there for you. Right. Now, let's say we, you are given an example where you have to, uh, a question where you have to calculate uh, the weight or the force of gravity for an object whose mass has been given. In this case, the mass of this object is given to us as 95 kilograms. So if we ask you to calculate the weight of this or the force of gravity or the gravitational force exerted on this object by the Earth, you then have to go to the formula Fg or M is equal to M times G. So W is equal to M times G, rather. So you then say Fg, this is what I prefer, force of gravity is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by the gravitational acceleration. So if you do your substitutions there, you'll know that the mass is given to you as 95 kilograms. So I'm going to multi uh, substitute 95 there. 
95 multiply by 9,8 and then we go to your calculator and look for the um, let's let me check my calculator here right so in this case we have 95 multiply by 9,8 and we get an answer 931 and therefore this is 931 newtons now remember like I said earlier on this is a vector quantity so the earth will always pull or, or exert a force of gravity on an object and that force will always be towards the center of the earth or we can say downwards because the center of the earth is down so you can write the weight downwards or even if you write towards the center of the earth you are more than welcome to do so so this is how we calculate the force of gravity or the weight of an object whose mass we know and that is the first force that we have to learn under Newton's laws. Now the next force that we need to know is what is referred to as the normal force and this is a force that we see a lot of learners are having a problem with when it comes to drawing of free body diagrams in both grade 11 and grade 12. Now what we have to understand is that this is a force in the exam guide, together with the CAPS document, you'll find the definition of this force as a force uh, or a component of a force which a surface exerts. And the most important thing here is that this is a force that is exerted by a surface with which the object is in contact. Okay, And this force will act perpendicular to the surface. So this therefore means that for us to have this normal force, one, we must have an object. Two, this object must be in contact with a surface. Then the surface will exert a force on this object. For an example, if you have a box and a table, here's a table, and you put a box on the table. Now, this means that the table has a surface, as we, we all know, or we can all see, and this is a box. Now, the box that is sitting on the table is now in contact with a surface, okay? So, the two requirements are met, that there must be a surface and there must be an object that is in contact with the surface. Therefore, this means that the surface will now exert a force on the box and this force is called the normal force. This normal force will always act perpendicular to the surface so this force will be exerted on the box by this surface and this force must be perpendicular to the surface which means that the angle between the surface here's our surface the angle between the surface and the normal force must be 90 degrees there is the angle there 90 degrees so if this is something that is always true or always uh, applicable to any normal force because the normal force must be exerted by the surface on an object that is in contact with it, the angle between the normal force and the surface must always be 90 degrees, which means if your surface is vertical, therefore the normal force will be horizontal, so that the angle between the two is 90. If your surface is horizontal, which is mostly the case, like in this case of a, of a table and a box, the surface is horizontal, therefore the normal force will be vertical. As you can see, the angle between the two will be 90 degrees at all at all times it's very very important that you know that especially when it comes to calculations and drawings so this um, normal force <clears throat> that will will be experienced by the the, the object uh, will always be perpendicular to the surface that is exerting it now there are examples of situations that involve objects that are in contact with surfaces and therefore there is a normal force you must also understand that there are situations where you're going to be dealing with problems that have objects that are not experiencing a normal force. And we've seen, we've seen this time and time again where learners would be writing normal force when there is no normal force. So these are examples, the following examples of situations where there is a normal force. Here we have a book uh, which is in contact with the surface. Okay. Here you have a book that is placed on a table. Obviously, the table has a surface and the book is in contact with that surface. Therefore, the surface of the table will exert a normal force on the book. And this normal force will definitely be perpendicular to 
the surface. Next, we have the, okay, let me just change this to pen. Next, we have the, next we have a chair that is in contact with the floor. Obviously, the floor being a surface and the chair being in contact with the floor, the floor will exert a normal force on the chair. Obviously, if a person comes and sits on the chair, the chair will then exert a normal force on the person because the chair also has its own surface which the person will be in contact with and therefore there will be normal force that is exerted on the person by the chair. And again, remember that this is a force that is going to be perpendicular to the surface. Okay, a person standing against the wall. This is a very interesting one because here we are looking at a person which, who is standing against a wall. As we can see, we are not mentioning the floor. Of course, this is a person that is standing. That means the feet are in contact with a floor. But we are not emphasizing that. Here we are emphasizing the fact that this person is also standing against the wall. So the surface that we are really talking about here is the wall. So the wall will exert a force called normal force on the person and that force will be perpendicular to the surface. Obviously we expect the wall to be a vertical um, wall which therefore the normal force will be exerted just like this pen. It will be facing, it will be uh, a, 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 a perpendicular to the wall, which is uh, what the normal force is. It's a force that is perpendicular to the surface. This is the surface that is perpendicular to the normal force. This is a vertical one and this would be a horizontal one. As opposed to when we have a surface that is, that is horizontal, then the normal force will be perpendicular to the surface and it will act vertical. Um, in the vertical di direction. Next, we are then looking at objects that do not experience a normal force. The first one, an example, is a ball that is hanging, as you can see, hanging from a ceiling. Now, if this is hanging from a ceiling, the object is not in contact with a surface. So this is an object, let's say this is your ceiling and this is the ball, here's a ball hanging. If this is the rope and this is our ball, obviously the ball is not in contact with any surface. Perhaps I should draw it this way so that it's not in contact with any of my lines. Okay, there's the ball, it's hanging from a rope or from a ceiling by a rope. Therefore, this ball is not experiencing any normal force because it is not in contact with any surface okay so another example is a hot air balloon a hot air balloon that is floating in the sky is not in contact with any surface and for that reason we say that the hot air balloon does not experience any normal force it it does experience other types of forces but not the normal force because the normal force requires that the object must be in contact with a surface so in this case there is no sur no surface Right, next we have a, pro, a, a projectile, what we call a projectile in grade 12. So here we have an object that is dropping from the top of a building. Any object that is dropping or falling from anywhere, as long as it is not attached to a string or anything, is not in contact with anything, therefore it means it's not in contact with any surface, that object is not experiencing a normal force at all. And the reason for all three situations for the ball hanging from the ceiling or a hot air balloon or a ball or an object dropping from the top of a building, all of them are not in contact with any surface and therefore we do not have a normal force. Please remember that especially when it's time to draw free body diagrams or to do calculations that if an object is not in contact with any surface, it does not experience any normal force. Okay. All right. Now the next kind of force that we're going to be looking at is what is referred to as the frictional force. Now this is a force that opposes the motion of, a, of an object and which acts parallel to the surface. So just like the normal force, this is a force that is there when there is a surface and an object in contact with that surface. So um, the frictional force is only there if there is a surface and it comes from the surface as well. But this one acts parallel to the surface as opposed to the normal force which acts perpendicular to the surface and that's something you need to remember. And the other thing that we need to look at is the fact that there are two types of frictional forces. The first one is a force of friction which 
is applicable only to objects that are not moving okay and that is referred to as the static frictional force and it is defined as the force that opposes the tendency of a motion okay in other words there is no motion yet but there's an intention to cause a motion okay so if there's an object that is stationary and not moving and there's a force that tries to move it the force that is going to oppose that motion is going to be the static frictional force because the object is moving is not moving uh, uh, pardon me so the only time the frictional force the kinetic frictional force will kick in uh, is when the object starts moving but for as long as the object is not moving and there's an intention to try and move it there will be a static frictional force which is only applicable to objects that are not moving okay now this type of frictional force is only present in objects that are not moving or are stationary or at rest you know that we use words such such as stationary or at rest in physical sciences and we know what that means it means that is an object that is not moving so an object that is not moving will experience a static frictional force now this force before we go into this line let me just uh, reverse it the force of uh, the static frictional force is one force that is unique in a sense that it is not constant in other words its value or its magnitude changes depending on the force that intends to move the stationary object in other words this force will take a value or a magnitude based on the force that is intending to move the stationary object okay but there is a maximum value that the static frictional force can only get to it does not keep on going up according to the force that is being applied at some point it reaches what is referred to as the maximum static frictional force where it cannot go beyond that and that's when the object will start moving after you've overcome that uh, maximum static friction so the maximum static friction is equal to the maximum horizontal force that can be applied on an object without causing it to start moving in other words there's a certain amount of force that you can apply to an object that is not moving and it remains stationary without moving that is because you have not exerted a force greater than the static friction or equal to the static friction okay so in this case uh, this maximum can be calculated according to the formula f f max is equals to mu s multiplied by n now we need to check what is what is what according to this uh, particular formula now in this formula uh, f s max is the maximum static frictional force um, and it's also measured in newtons as usual and then the next thing that appears in that formula is what is referred to as mu s mu s is the coefficient of static friction and because it's just a coefficient it has no units it's, it's, it's actually a ratio okay and lastly we have capital letter n for normal force okay so this is the normal force that we explained in the previous slide remember the first force that we dealt with was the weight then we moved to the normal force this is the now there's a relationship between the normal force and the frictional force okay like i said earlier on we need to understand the forces and their their relationships so there is a force there's a relationship between the normal force and the frictional force in this case we are looking at the static frictional force remember the static frictional force is only there if the object is not moving if the object is moving there is no static frictional force we have another type of a force which is the force that we are going to go to right now and that is referred to as the kinetic frictional force the kinetic frictional force now is defined as the force that opposes the motion of a moving object as you can see there we have a moving object relative to the surface obviously the word kinetic has to do with motion here we expect that this type of frictional force will be present on objects that are moving we don't expect a kinetic frictional force for objects that are not moving um, and just like the the, the previous uh, frictional force the kinetic frictional force also has a formula which can be applied or used 
to calculate this kinetic friction. The difference between the two, as you can see, this one is Fk, the previous one was Fs for static friction. This one is Fk for kinetic friction. So this is the force that we we experience uh, will be experienced by forces by objects that are moving, and uh, the, if if uh, they are moving on a surface that is rough, and therefore we have the kinetic friction. Now in this case, obviously we expect the Fk to be the kinetic friction. Again, it's measured in newtons, just like the static friction. And then we also have the coefficient of kinetic friction, which is different from the coefficient of static friction. Okay, again, we have the normal force. The two formula are, are quite similar. The only difference is that in this case, we have Fk instead of Fs. And we also have mu k for the coefficient of kinetic friction. And again, there are no units for the coefficient of kinetic friction. Okay. Now, let's look at an example. Okay. Now, in this example, we have a book that is sliding to the right across a surface of a table while experiencing a normal force of 5 newtons. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the surface and the table is 0, 0,2. The question that we are expected to answer is for us to calculate the frictional force experienced by the book. And we already saw the weight sliding. Now, if we saw the weight sliding, it means this is an object that is moving. Therefore, we expect to be calculating Fk, which is a frictional force that is applicable to moving objects. We do have the formula at the top there. Fk is equal to mu k multiplied by the normal force. Okay. Then we now look at the statements to see uh, if we have all the information that we need. Number one, as you can see, there's a 0, 0,2 here, and we are told that this is your mu k, which is the coefficient of kinetic friction. And we also have the normal force also uh, given to us there in the statement. So this is an easy one. We're just going to go straight and say 0, 0,2 multiplied by 5. And if you check your calculator, um, it, should, it should be an easy one to do even without the calculator, but let's always be safe. As you can see there, 0, 0,2 multiplied by 5 is equals to 1. And we get 0, 0,5. Uh, we get 1 as our answer, 1 newton as the answer. And of course, because this is a book that is sliding, let me just remove this so that we can see. This is a book that is sliding to the right. And remember, the force must oppose the direction of motion. So if the book is sliding to the right, therefore, it means the frictional force must be moving or must be to the left, okay? And that's it about the frictional forces. We have the kinetic friction, and earlier on we looked at the static friction, right? Now, lastly, the last types of forces or group of forces that we're going to be looking at are forces that are coming from other objects. In other words, these are forces that are applied or exerted on other objects by other objects, okay? Now, when, when I say other objects, I'm referring to objects that are not the surface because we know the surface can either exert the normal force or the frictional force. And also the earth can exert the force of gravity, which is also referred to as the weight. So sometimes an object will be experiencing a force which is not coming from any of those. So this is where now we're looking at this other group of forces. And these are forces. Remember, a force by definition uh, by its simple definition is either a push or a pull okay so a force may be applied on one object by an external object through a push or a pull and in a situation like that the push or pull force uh, may be represented by the symbol fa for force applied or applied force or just the simple capital letter f to show that there is a force that is applied on this object by another object okay now this is a force that we are going to likely see coming from either a person pulling an object or a person pushing an object. We are going to see applied force coming from various objects and applied on other objects as well. Okay. Then we have a special type of an applied force, which is called tension. Right. Now, this is a force that is applied on an object through a rope or a string when it is stretched. So you might see a situation where a person is pulling a box with a, a string. You know, attach a string to a box and then you pull the box. That force applied has a special name called tension. So that tension is also a force applied, but it's applied through a rope.
But if the person just pushes the box directly in contact with it, then we are going to use the symbol FA for force applied. But if the person uses a string or a rope to pull, or even if it's a, it's a car pulling another car or a truck pulling another car, you know, in that situation we have what we call tension. And the symbol that we use for tension is capital letter T or FT to represent this tension force. Okay, so these are the types of forces that we need to know about and we need to know where they come from. We need to know the symbol that we use. As you've seen with the frictional force, the weight and the normal, those, the first three forces we looked at, all three of them have designated formulas or equations that we can use to calculate them. For instance, with the weight, we know we can say the weight is equal to the mass multiplied by the gravitational acceleration. The frictional force, it can be calculated by saying the force, the frictional force is equal to mu k or mu s multiplied by the normal. You see, with those forces, there's a specific formula that we can use. With these forces that are coming from other objects, there is no specific formula that is used to calculate Fa. Now, this is where we start using relationships between the forces to calculate forces such as Fa or tension and, and other forces. Not to say that we cannot calculate the frictional force using the relationships between the forces. Of course, you, we can. Now, this is where the laws come in. We now need to understand the laws. So... We have to know that the, the what is the relationship between this force and this force or when this force combines with this force what do they give us then we can use that relationship the mathematical relationship to calculate whichever force we need to calculate so we can calculate the friction using a, a mathematical relationship between it and other forces of course we can but what we do also have is that we can calculate the frictional force using a formula that it that is de designated for the frictional force which we don't have for applied forces such as fa and tension we don't have a formula to calculate that we use the mathematical relationship according to newton's laws that's where the laws become important now now let's just look at a picture showing a situation where you have all forces all the forces that we spoke about being applied on the same object of, co of course we spoke about different types of forces now here's a situation where you have an object that is experiencing all five forces we have a tension on as you can see uh, going to the left we also have fk obviously in this case it means this is an object that is moving because we have fk fk is applied um, on a moving object by the surface we have the weight of course any object that has mass has weight we have the normal force obviously this means this is an object that is in contact with the surface this is a giveaway and this is also another giveaway the normal force and the frictional force are only there if the object is in contact with the surface and also we have an applied force this could be a force coming from another object through a contact or um, uh, as a push or as a pull right in the next lesson what we're going to be looking at is how do we get to a point where we draw a diagram such as this one which is referred to as the free body diagram. One of the most important skills that you need to acquire as a grade 11 and a grade 12 learner in physical sciences is to draw a free body diagram. It's extremely important because it's applicable in other topics other than just the Newton's laws. It is also found in other topics as well. And it's a very, very important skill that you need to make sure that you acquire while you are learning uh, this particular topic. Right. I hope that you are empowered by today's lesson and you have a better understanding on the different kinds of forces. It is very important that you keep on watching the video if you don't understand a certain portion of this lesson and you make sure that you understand these types of forces before we move to the laws. Because by the time you get to the laws, the understanding is that you, you already know the different uh, types of forces. So when you go through the laws, you must have mastered the types of forces and you must have also mastered what we are going to do in the next lesson, which is the drawing of free body diagram together with force diagrams. And that's the end of today's lesson. We meet again in the next lesson where we're going to be looking at those diagrams. I hope you are empowered by this lesson from Butu Academy. We meet again in the next lesson. Thank you.